Hey, good morning, everybody. It's Brian with Team Aquascape. Pond boys, pond girls, we've got a fun one for you this week. Something a little different. We are going to take you through step-by-step -step on landscaping an existing water feature. And I think the fun thing about the landscaping is it really takes the pond to its fullest potential. To me, without the plants, the pond is completely incomplete. <laughs> <laughs> completely incomplete. Like it needs the decorations around it. The way the plants will grow over the edge, the height back behind the waterfalls, strategic planting helps create a lot of mystery. So we're gonna take you through that step by step by step and how we actually accomplish that with the help of some of our dear friends from Wasco Nursery. We're still out here at the Naperville project and we are gonna finish this week. So the following week, we get to take you through the final reveal of that project, which is gonna be amazing. And you spend this much time on a project, it better be amazing, right? So feeling good that there's a light at the end of the tunnel on that one. So hang on tight. You guys know what to do. We got a lot going on. Here we go. We are going to build a pondless waterfall. The best way to learn anything is to teach it. We are rocking and rolling on this pond. I'm here at my good friend, Tony Akala's house. Tony and I have been working together for mm, 22 years, but have been known each other most of our lives. Tony and I went to high school together. He stood up in my wedding. I stood up in his wedding. He's at a new house over here. The guy built a pond all by himself. How? I have no idea. Literally got the nine, 10 tons of boulders delivered to his driveway, dug the hole by hand, moved all the rocks by hand. It's something as a pond builder, I would never want to do all by myself. Like no way, but the guy did it. This is my first time visiting his new pond and I'm here to help him landscape the thing because I know the landscaping is gonna take it to a whole nother level. And so this is gonna be fun. How to properly landscape a backyard pond. Here we go. Tony say hi. <laughs> what an awesome host. And actually, this is exactly what I was picturing. I wanted to come back here, just kind of take it all in, generate some ideas from where he sits the most. And so this is so important. Whether I'm designing a pond, designing the landscape, I want to know how they're using the backyard. And he said he sits here, Yancey sits over here, or vice versa, it doesn't really matter. But this is the area they love to sit the most. And this is where I would sit. Every single day I would come home, I'd want to sit as close to the pond as possible. And you can see how he did such a great job of pulling that pond in here. Lucy, get out of the way. <laughs> Good girl. So we've got all kinds of ideas, but I think we should start with how we're going to use the existing beautiful living space he's created out here and really take this pond to the next level. He's got a gorgeous patio out here. All these different living areas. This is a really cool outdoor dining area. I love the fact that he's got these swivel chairs because there's no way with a waterfall behind you, you could be facing this way. You constantly want to be swiveling around over here. After dinner, you come over here for your after dinner drinks. Sit down in this cozy area. I love the umbrella, super cozy. I'd probably be taking a nap in this area here. And then you've got the after dinner dinner drinks, after after dinner drinks down by the fire pit. This area is great. We got all kinds of different seating areas. Everything faces towards that waterfall. And then you've done what I do with so many of our customers, like party here, but still 90% of the time, it's the two of you. And you've got this little intimate area that sits right up by the pond. The one thing I forgot to show you is there's also that view from inside. So we got a kitchen window, we've got our dining room, window. And we also want to think about the landscape from here. And the first thing I noticed when I walked out this back door here was how much traffic I see. Like it's crazy. We've got a school over here. We've got a busy road over there. I must have seen 15 head kind of bop up and down along this fence over here. The thing that I would have to do if it were my own is block all that off. In fact, there goes a bike rider. It's ruining the whole vibe. It's killing me. Not that I don't like his get up the helmet and the red shorts and everything, but we got to block that off. So we're going to need some height back in here. The other thing I noticed What's kind of great is we got some borrowed views. So if we look across the street, we've got some linden trees back there. There's a big maple back over in there. I see a white pine starting to put on some growth. The neighbor over here has got an autumn blaze maple. That thing's going to get bigger and bigger. So I want to take into consideration some of the borrowed views. Even this locust tree over here. Tony, I think you said there was a big evergreen that sat here before. Now that that evergreen's gone, that thing's really going to start spreading out and creates more of an intimate space. So the thing I want to try to do with the landscape is try to really create an intimate space, block off some of this traffic and really just take this thing to the next level. Come on, here's what I'm thinking. 
what I noticed from this area here is if I do a lot of landscaping right in this area, inevitably anything I put there is gonna block the view of the waterfall. And so I gotta get permission from Tony and his fiance and, and find out if that's okay, because for me it's okay. I don't need to see the entire water feature from every angle of the backyard. Creating a little bit of mystery is something I'm really, really focused on with every project I design, and it's okay. So I really like the idea of maybe the baby blue spruce, maybe a hemlock. Gets a lot of sun, but you know, as this locust tree is getting bigger and bigger, it's gonna get more filtered sun, which the hemlock would really like. Now this is the most challenging area I've ever seen for a landscape. Usually back behind the biofalls, we've got a little bit more room, but sometimes in these smaller, tighter areas, this is all we get to play with. So we've only got about two feet to play with between the edge of the biofall and the retaining wall that's keeping the soil off the vents. So in here, we're gonna look for like ornamental grasses. Maybe we're gonna think of like a tiger eye sumac, something that can kind of come out, shoot out over this, grasses that'll give us some winter texture because you don't have to cut them down later in the summer. I'm debating on playing around with a black lace elderberry. They get pretty big, but again, we can prune them and keep them shorter and shorter. But I want to fill this area. I want to get up nice and tall. I would like plants to get at least three feet, four feet taller than the fence line. This is a six foot high fence and we're seeing the top of heads pop up and down here. And when you're inside the kitchen and you're even higher, you can see over the top of this that much easier. So we want to get some height in here and that's got to happen. Back along that fence, I think it's just really important to break up the fence so we don't see the fence as much. Again, we're very limited, especially as we get down over there by the skimmer box. There's only a foot. So we might play around with doing like even some clematis and some climbing vines and doing some lattice and stuff over there. And then just a sea of perennials in front of that. My favorite ponds, and you guys have heard Greg talk about it, you've heard me talk about it, are the ones where I can't tell where the water ends and the land begins. So everything that we're gonna plant on that backside, we're gonna plant with the idea that whole back edge is gonna disappear. So one more area I really try to focus hard on hiding is always a skimmer box. And it's fine, nobody else really pays attention to it, but a plant right in here is gonna stop your eye from going that way. The challenging part is me putting a plant right here makes it very difficult for Tony to get over here and maintain the skimmer. If I can put the plant here with a little bit of height and he can sneak behind that plant to get it, we'll still block the view of that skimmer. Maybe then come in with something a little lower that can creep over this. There's so many plants that we call like steppables that can handle the occasional foot traffic. So we're probably gonna look for something he can actually step on right here. And then over it here, we'll get something that kind of comes over the top of this. Think of like a, right now the only plant that's coming to mind is like a hosta. So if I can put a hosta right here and the leaves fall on top of this, I can still push those leaves back, get inside of my skimmer box and easily maintain it. Last thing we got to think about, and this is something that I know Greg is super passionate about, is the aquatic plant. Now Tony, you're killing it with the lilies. You got three lilies in here. I noticed you got a tropical. The tropicals are always the ones with kind of the serrated edges. You've got a detective Erica, which is a new hybrid. At times you said you've had three flowers on that thing. And then you've got a Juan Visa over here that'll fill in quite a bit of space. But I think you're good on lilies because this is the first year and you're already seeing some major growth on them. I also really like this area. And what I really want you to do in this space here, because it started happening, you've got like this curve that comes back like this and then it starts coming out this way. If I want to try to accentuate this curve, normally I would try to do it with the rock. If you've already got the big rocks here though, and we're not going to move them out to here, by taking plants like a variegated sweet flag or Japanese iris here, imagine this iris as it starts to mature, creeping all the way out to here. And this whole thing being a mass of irises right here. This will help actually give shape and character to the pond and a lot of interest. I can see doing some more creeping Jenny tucked into these areas that kind of creep in through here and then up onto the land and intermix with all of our perennials. And then the perennials kind of overhanging this area. Water forget-me-nots are one of my favorite. I love the sweet flag, the Japanese sweet flag down in here. But maybe we leave a spot where you just buy some tropicals every year. A lot of people don't want to use the tropical plants because they feel like they're just throwing money away. Yes, every year this plant is going to have to die. Every year you're going to have to replace it. But the advantage to tropical plants, especially a tropical water lily or tropical perennials, will grow considerably faster, create a lot more interest, and it's okay. Do your pond a favor. Go out and get some tropical plants, especially if you live in the Midwest. You won't regret it, promise. Then we've got this space. So what do we do in this space? This is really, really hard. When sitting in this space here, you've got to keep it low. Anything that would come up too high is going to completely block the view of the pond. So maybe just some ground covers, maybe some sedums, maybe some creeping junipers, Pacific blue juniper is one of my favorites. We'll look at just some different plant options. I think the next stop is get out to the garden center, talk with my good friend Matt Zerby from Wasco Nursery, get some different ideas, look to see what they've got available this time of year. I got some ideas running my head. I've got a video. 
We can take some pictures. Let's go figure this out. All right, guys, so we're here at Wasco Nursery. I love coming to this place. I really love coming to garden centers in general just because there's so much inspiration. And I have an idea of what I want to do at Tony's house, but if I have like 10 or 20 ideas, it's nowhere near as many ideas as Matt, the owner of Wasco Nursery, is going to have. A lot of times, too, I like to just come to the garden center and walk around. Like, I see all these different hydrangeas blooming right now. I'm wondering if there's a location for some of that over there. I see different lilac trees. I see this big weeping white pine back over behind me. Like, there's just so much cool stuff here. It's an awesome, awesome garden center. It's enormous, and Matt's a genius. So let's go get Matt's ideas. I gave him a video of the place. Let's see how many of my ideas tie in with his. Oh my God, Tony, like already I'm thinking of some of this stuff down in front, you know, right where that patio meets the pond area. Like this would look great. I'm gonna tell you all these ideas, but Matt, hey, how's it hey, going, man? Good, how you doing? I actually saw these on a video that you did earlier, and yeah. I was like, what is this one? They're fantastic. So all of these see them, like these are gonna do great along the pond edge. So see them being a succulent, love to grow in and around the rocks. They're great for just kind of that natural feel, just so you don't see the pond edge everywhere. So I love using that kind of stuff. I got the video that you sent over, awesome. so I've got a handful of ideas, but we can walk around, well, let's go look, look at, at a few things, yeah. and yeah. Let's go, we'll go from there. I'm super curious on the plants you're thinking for behind the waterfall, okay. because you know as well as I know, there's very, very limited space back there. My idea is that I want to get some height back there to just sort of soften the corner of the fence behind, but with that limited amount of soil in there, we need to get some height, but we don't have a whole lot of room for a big root ball. So I was thinking about a plant called Black Lake Elderberry. Oh, genius. <laughs> <laughs> We're one for one. <laughs> well, it's a great plant for its really interesting texture because it has that lacy leaf, uh -huh. you know, which we'll look at, but it also does give you that height. It's sort of even like a Japanese maple substitute because not every spot we can work a Japanese maple in and maybe in a few areas around sure. here, they're not super hardy, right? Where the Black Lace Elderberry is tough as nails and it actually responds really well to that sort of rejuvenation pruning yeah. or just hutting it off at the ground and letting it grow back. I love this plant. I think those will do really well in there. I think the color will be great. So another super challenging spot was gonna be that area to the right of the waterfall. Yep. And I really wanna just get that area to disappear. I don't wanna see the rock. This is challenging because it's gotta soften up that big brown fence. Yeah. And it's also gotta grow over the edge. Yeah. My mind instantly, when I came in and I pulled in, I was looking at the grasses over there. So many varieties of grasses, you know? And I lean towards like some of these with the softer textures and stuff. Uh -huh. The challenge with these types of grasses, I don't think it's gonna give us the height that we're looking for to really soften up that wall. Yeah. So what were you thinking? So I was thinking maybe switch grasses. Switch grasses are going to give you an upright profile All right. without getting super wide. You know, the other thing about some of the grasses, some of them can get like massively wide and I don't think you necessarily have the room for that. Yeah. Some grasses I've actually seen, they run these like, you know, the roots, the rhizomes, whatever, sure. yep. are going through the soil and it's a lot like bamboo yep. where it's like a needle running through the soil and I've actually seen it go right through the line. Yeah, in our prairies around here, they're gonna have roots that go down six, eight feet and they can, they're super drought tolerant, they hold up great, but not a lot of runners or anything like that. But they also are very upright and narrow. So you're not gonna have the building way over Love and it. taking up a ton of room. They only get about four to five feet high, so tall enough yeah, that it'll perfect. that'll soften the fence, but not so big that it's gonna be, you know, overtaking the fence or overtaking that area. I love this area. one. And you said this one is gonna continue to develop some more of this burgundy as we go later into the season? Yeah, so it's just starting to turn burgundy in the spring. It's basically all green. As the summer progresses, you start to get a little burgundy. And then as we progress from summer into fall, it just develops more and more burgundy colors. So we're going from the black lace elderberries to then these grass here to then what? So I think what we'll do is right after the grasses, as we progress down the fence, we're going to take a step down to like a two to three foot or three to four foot high, sort of more mounding or spreading shrub. And I was thinking about a plant called deer villa. So this is the deer villa that I was talking about. This is going to get around waist high. It's a mounding or even spreading shrub. One of the things that I love about it are these red stems. So even when it's not in bloom, it's going to give you some cool color, interest, and texture. But the little yellow flowers on here, which the butterflies love, the hummingbirds love, and the bumblebees love, will start in June, go all through July, and then even well into August with those little yellow flowers. And then it gives you a bonus with some really nice fall color, orangey, kind of oh, reddish cool. color in the fall. So. so Matt, I really was so worried about hiding that big fence back there. Yeah. Because it's such like a dominant structure. Mm -hmm. You're almost focused more on the fence than you are the pond. Yeah. Right? And so we've got all those plants hiding up with these being like three feet tall. Yep. We still have another, you know, four feet of fence behind it. Could we do like a clematis or something back behind these? That would work perfect. One of the things about clematis is clematis is a weird plant. It likes sun on its top. So the leaves and the flowers and everything uh -huh. like the sun, but the root system likes the shade. So we could put a trellis up against the fence, plant the clematis right on there. And then you can have <laughs> tons of flowers all throughout the growing season. 
So we still have that one big signature plant. And so, Tony, if you remember this, it's gonna block the view, a little bit of the waterfall, but I still like, even on a small pond, seeing a little mystery, you don't have to see everything from one spot. I was thinking of a hemlock there, but you had a different idea. Well, I mean, I think a hemlock could work, but one of the things I was thinking about is a weeping Alaskan cedar, just because I think it's really going to offer a, like a wow factor. I think they're a really cool tree. Width-wise, it's only gonna get eight to 10 feet wide, so it's not gonna take up a ton of space. It's also not overly dense, so you can, you yeah. can kind of still see through some of these areas here without it being like this huge hole, like block, Tony, can't see anything past it. Tony, I love this one, especially this specific one, because this is a fatter one. Sometimes you see them really, really columnar and thin and more amoebic. This is like a fat one. And so this thing is gonna fill that base. And right now, you don't have like a signature plant back there. So let's go with the professional and go with the weeping Alaskan cedar. I think it's a good choice. Love I it. think it's gonna look awesome right there. So I am way more knowledgeable in trees and shrubs. Hardly know anything about perennials, but I know we need some color. Yeah. And so I love that you brought us over to the cone flowers here. And you have a huge selection. Yeah, it's kind of cool because when I first started in the business, it was basically just purple cone flowers. Yep. And now there's whites and yellows and pinks and some that are tall and some that are short and some that have you know, the greenish colored flowers and all sorts of stuff. And one of the things that I love to do with these is actually just mix all the different colors up. So what I was thinking about doing with these is to the right of where we're gonna put the weeping Alaskan cedar is do like a nice Nice little area. I don't know, it might end up being five to seven feet wide and two to three feet yep. deep. And we just get three or four or five different varieties of cone flower and just kind of randomly mix them in there. I think that green. one actually would work really well. Green just drop one of those in there yep. because with that cool greenish white hue to it, that so really different. just sets all of the other colors off. And then, you know, maybe we throw like one of the big white ones and there's some cool yellow ones. We've got some more yeah, off the one too. Really, really red. I love it. Well, I think between weeping Alaskan cedar and the width on that thing, the black lace elderberry, your villa, some of these different perennials. And then we've got some other fillers. You're gonna do some sedums and different succulents and stuff here and there. I think we've got a plan, Tony. I think it's gonna look fantastic. Are you excited? <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> awesome, this is gonna look great. Matt, thanks for your help, man. Anytime. Uh, it's so, I always get inspired coming here. You have a gorgeous, gorgeous garden center. Oh, thank you. I think the man behind the camera is excited too. Yeah. Because he built this pond a long time ago <laughs> now. And decorating this thing is going to be great. Not just for Tony, but for all of our viewers. Sounds thanks, good. Man. Anytime. Right, Appreciate care. it. Back here at Tony's house, so you can see some of those black lace elderberry in the back corner. The signature weeping Alaskan cedar. You guys remember how much I love those big trees like in the foreground? It really, as we said before, it's really gonna make that space feel really intimate over there by the fire pit. And then we've got all kinds of pops of color. You got some of the cone flowers in here. We got a huge mix, so we get orange flowers and red flowers and yellow flowers and white flowers. We got all kinds of sedums and succulents here in the foreground, keeping it really low. It doesn't look like much now. This is gonna be one of those projects that develop over time. And I think probably made the same mistake that a lot of new gardeners have made and probably planted this stuff a little tight. <laughs> Some of the black lace elderberry will end up getting actually six to even seven feet tall, six to seven feet wide. The idea though was to block everything that's on the other side of that fence. So I think effortlessly that'll happen. Um, I'm excited to see this come together. We're almost done. We have to mulch it and then Tony's gonna have to water it because it is the worst time of year to actually be putting plants in. This is also gonna be one of those where I want you guys to really follow along because year after year after year, like we say so many times, a pond is one thing that'll actually appreciate in value over time. And this thing is just gonna look better and better and better. You know, the last stage is really watering the plants, especially when it's like 95 degrees outside. Not the best time to be planting, but when's the best time to plant a tree? That's right, 100 years ago. <laughs> or today, right? So whether it's summer, spring, fall, whatever, get the plants in the ground, just make sure you water them. The bigger point of the whole thing, the whole process, 
process was look at how much different this pond looks now than what it looked like before. Between the trees, the elderberries, the different grasses, even when that clematis over there starts spreading up along that fence, it's just gonna look amazing. All this stuff is gonna fill in and mature and look better and better and better year after year. Well, hey everybody, thanks for watching. It actually really means a lot to us that you watched this all the way through. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. Tell me your favorite part. Did you like the transformation? Because it's pretty epic, right? And for like a little less than $2,000, you can take a very nice pond to an incredible pond. And you guys have to be just as excited as I am when I think about the future of that pond. I mean, those plants we planted in the middle of the summer, 95 degrees outside, worst time to plant ever. And I know Tony's gonna take care of it and those things are gonna flourish and do better and better and better and the one thing we always say is every water feature project we put in the ground actually gains value year after year after year especially when you landscape it and take care of it and so on and so on it's one of the very few things you can invest in that will grow and mature over time and actually maintain its worth if not increase its worth if you like this video like comment subscribe tell us your favorite part and if you thought that was a cool transformation wait till you see next week because we are finished out here in naperville we're going to start planting the rest of this thing water truck just showed up, filled up our upper pond. We took a simple area of grass back here, dropped in about 200 tons of stone and a whole lot of labor. And I can't wait to show you guys the reveal of this project next week. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell your neighbors, tell your children, get everybody to watch, make it an event, and we'll see you next week. Bye.